Mental health is very important to me. I think it is just as important as physical health. Our mental health impacts our perceptions. All we have of reality is perceptions, and we need to be together on those perceptions. I think it's important for members of the community to know that it should be treated like any other medical condition. There's a cure, you know, there's help here within Center County. I believe that is something that we can all provide to our friends and families and coworkers is listening. When the world says give up, hope whispers, try one more time. Every single human being is susceptible. It could affect anyone. And that we should be educated to be able to help them. How we can help, how we can support, how we can do better for them, for ourselves, for our community. Hi, I'm Rick Bingham, director of Sutter Yuba Behavioral Health. Our mental wellness is an integral part of our day-to-day -day functioning and contributes to how we feel, process information, and interact with others. Many of us take our mental wellness for granted until we have a bad day. On those days, we often lack energy, have difficulty concentrating, and don't feel like our usual selves. Some individuals come across these bad days much more intensely than others, and they experience significant symptoms that hinder their ability to work, socialize, and engage in other routine activities. When symptoms become very serious, help is needed right away. Imagine you're at a dinner party and you see a friend experiencing what seems to be a medical emergency, like a heart attack. What would you do? If you are trained in CPR, you may be able to provide life-sustaining measures until a paramedic arrives. Now imagine that you're with a friend who seems to be experiencing a mental health crisis, something that needs intervention just as urgently as your friend having the heart attack. What would you do? Mental Health First Aid serves this very purpose. It teaches people how to respond to a mental health emergency just as folks are trained in CPR. Sutter Yuba Behavioral Health has trained close to 900 people in Sutter and Yuba counties in Mental Health First Aid, helping those individuals just like you feel more prepared to help those in need. Please enjoy this video that discusses Mental Health First Aid and hear firsthand accounts from members of our community about the training they received. Mental health first aid, day one, mark, common marker. Well, the way I think of it, mental health is probably the most, well, one of the most important parts of our lives in terms of determining our happiness, our well-being. It's fundamental, I guess, to who we are as people. I think it is probably the pinnacle of what needs to be cared for in a person. It informs and drives so many different conditions, whether it's physical or spiritual or social. It just has a great impact on how a person thinks about themselves, how they behave, and, and how they interact and how they do their lives. The mental health can affect us in so many ways and people don't realize that. When somebody suffers from mental health, it's going to affect the way they live. It's going to affect whether or not they can go to work, whether they can go to school, whether they can socialize with uh, their friends. Their relationships start to suffer when, uh, when they suffer from mental health disorder. And so many times they might start with one and go on to another one, what we call comorbidity. If a person is living with depression, at some point they will probably develop anxiety as well and vice versa. A person that's living with anxiety eventually tends to develop depression. So I, I think mental health can affect um, communities and families, relationships in, in very different ways, from minor ways to maybe more extreme ways. Um, similarly to how physical uh, injuries or physical health problems might have minor impacts on people's lives and the lives of those around them and may have major impacts. It's critical. It's as critical as your physical health. It really is. Indeed, people who have poor physical health can still live very fulfilling lives as long as they can have good mental health. But the opposite is not really true. So maybe it's more critical.
Well, um, frankly, that, that I didn't realize the number was quite that high. It doesn't surprise me that over 50% of uh, people are at some point in time in their lives diagnosed. I think the number may even be higher than that, <laughs> but um, I think we're all touched by mental health, mental health issues, whether it's a neighbor, a family member, ourselves. You know, I think if you'd asked me that um, maybe a decade ago, I would have thought that was a surprising statistic. It's not really surprising. I would assume just from my own experience that the term diagnosis is very important because it's probably higher than that. There's probably many more people who are not diagnosed but still feel the effects of mental illness throughout their lives. One of the reasons that people never get diagnosed with a mental illness is because of uh, what we call like internalized stigma, which is when the stigma that exists in society around mental health conditions is something that becomes internalized into the person's own belief system, which makes it hard for them later on in life to seek treatment when they do start to experience mental health symptoms. Mental health is something that may come and go throughout someone's life and you may pass through a period of time when you don't have that mental health. Uh, and so it doesn't surprise me at all that the figure is maybe high for some people, but it doesn't seem high to me. You know, I think it could be low, but I also think it could be common, right? So if there's more than 50% of us that experience a behavioral health condition over our lifetime, you know, I want people not to think of that in a scary way. I want them to think, gosh, this is something we have in common. Like, you know, we've got broken arms or we all have stomach aches or, you know, we all get headaches. And so um, it is common. And I hope that because we all have this condition that we can experience together um, over our life, that we can connect around it and we can support each other around getting help and talking about it openly and it won't be so stigmatized. It's self-reported, so the person has to kind of look within themselves and say, am I going to share this with you? Am I gonna open myself up with you? Only about 5% of our population say, yes, I am dealing with that. And we know that it's much higher. When it comes to substances, you can say, yeah, I've got an addiction issue, I've got this problem, and if I can just get away from it, I'll be fine. But I think a lot of people, if they say, well, I've got a problem inside, and I don't know if I can get away with it, so I don't really want to open up and share that with you. And so it doesn't surprise me to hear that numbers could be that high because we see people who don't really want to admit that, and yet working with them, we realize, well, the number's much higher. We have to differentiate between diagnosable mental illness and who can have mental health issues. And it's a spectrum, right? Uh, we all feel sad at some point in our lives, and when we feel sad, we usually feel sad for a couple of days and then we come out of it. Diagnosable mental illness is different. So that's the differentiating between 50% of the population will have a diagnosable mental illness versus do we all deal with mental health issues in our lives. We all deal with anxiety, sadness, fear, all that kind of stuff. Uh, and those are all, those are all come in the realm of uh, mental health issues per se. I'm not surprised at all that it would be 50%. Let me tell you, when I teach the mental health first aid class, we talk about why should we discuss mental health first aid? And I ask the whole group, how many of you know someone right now that is living with a mental health disorder? And I say about a third of the hands go up. And when I say, how many of you have at some point in your life known someone? And about two thirds go up. And then I say, did you know that depression and anxiety are also considered mental health disorder? And then like pretty much all the hands go up. Almost every one of us knows someone that has lived with a mental health disorder, be it depression or anxiety. If at any given time in the United States, in one year, something like 20% of the population is living with a mental health disorder, 18 to 20%. It's not surprising that in a lifetime, it would be much, much higher. The, the encouraging thing is that if 50% of us are gonna experience mental health disorder and only 18 to 20 have it in a year, that's encouraging because then we know that recovery is not only possible, but it's probable. So someone that's living with a mental health disorder is not gonna stay there forever. They can get help. And in, in many situations, it improves or diminishes or it goes away completely. I think back to watching the premiere of Saving Private Ryan, and the theater was open only to veterans that had served in World War II. We thought it was grand. We thought it was a great idea. There was a high school band waiting for him outside. There was politicians. There were crowds of friends and family ready to cheer when they came out of the theater. In this silent moment, when you know the movie is over and they're coming out, 
the door to the theater burst open. The man is weeping. The wife is saying, I didn't know, honey. I, you didn't say anything. And the next guy comes out, and he's angry as can be. And it just brought back so much to these soldiers. And it was clear we had been stuffing this for so long. And we did not deal with it. We did not recognize it, especially in the 40s and the 50s with these huge numbers of Americans that were lost in combat. And it's just an example. But today, we recognize PTSD. And there's a bit of um, respect that goes along for somebody with that. We, under we give them a pass. And do we recognize that there's PTSD for firemen, for cops? Uh, for a lot of people that have to do emergency response. It's still very active, um, and I, I don't know that we have gotten there yet, but I think we've emerged. I think we're getting there. I've been a fireman for close to 27 years. I am deeply committed to the mental health of first responders. We have seen the effects within our department and within our county and surrounding agencies. We've all lost friends to mental health. We've lost family members to mental health. And it's important for everybody to realize that first responders are not exempt. We suffer and see things that people don't normally see and have to find a way to deal with those. So as fire chief, I've made that commitment to make sure that my staff, surrounding staff, and other departments are educated in mental health first aid and also just mental health support for my staff and all of uh, surrounding agencies. When I started, we had a uh, kind of a tradition that you sent the new guy in or new girl in to do all the dirty work or all the unfavorable work, so to speak. You didn't get to talk about it back then and uh, that's definitely had a, a toll on me when you go home your family and you're not supposed to talk about it. Um, I think what we're trying to accomplish here is, is helping because uh, we're getting it out there. There seems to be a huge push in mental health and uh, taking care of people. I wish this was available to me when I started. I started when I was 20. Um, I've seen a lot. Um, we won't get into details, but you know, over the years, I've had, we've known people, I've had close friends um, that have committed suicide. Um, first responders that let the situations get too in depth, I would say, and, and didn't get help that they needed. Taking it very seriously on my back and also um, looking to my staff um, we've had to use that in the past and, and use this formula to try to be supportive and help our staff get support in the way that they need. Sometimes in our job, we just need to talk it out. Uh, we see a lot of things in this profession that most people don't will never see in their life. And it has an effect on us. And sometimes we don't understand the effects that it's having and why it's having the effects. So having those outreaches for the employees has been very good. One of the hard things in, in any job is we talk about that stigma that when we use that word, the people are afraid to go get help. In any place, I'm the boss and, or there's a boss person, or there, there's, there's that person. So I'm trying to break down that barrier. Uh, as the fire chief, I, I want to be my staff's confidant, not necessarily, or my staff's supporter, not necessarily just their boss. In the past, you come back, you kind of laugh and joke about it and uh, tell crude jokes in the station. 
The general public doesn't always get that, but that's always talked about. Like, these are some of the crudest people I've met, but what they don't understand is that's how we, we work past that grief. I'd say the biggest thing up until now has always been just talking to your crew. Um, I've always uh, kind of noticed when I'm getting to that point. I've had it described to me once and I've kind of carried that through. Um, everybody has a cup or a container and your mental health, if that's representing your mental health, yours might be bigger than mine, mine might be bigger than yours. And I've always kind of known when mine's about ready to overfill and knowing I probably need to get in to talk to somebody and getting that back under a manageable level. And then once it creeps back up, uh, it's not probably the best way to go about it, but it's helped me. I think there's been a huge shift uh, in mental health um, in society in general, um, more specifically within um, the fire department and EMS. I think people have noticed the amount of suicides, the amount of drinking, the amount of time lost. And I hate to say it, but everything has a dollar value. And when you start to, some statistician starts to go, hey, we're losing a million dollars a year on these employees going out with mental health issues. We probably better do something about that. Let's pump some money into that and, and get these people some help so they aren't taking the time off. I think there's been a, a huge uptake and a, and a huge shift in the, in the right direction, but we're nowhere near where we should be. Since the beginning of the fire service, it's been that way. Don't change it, it's not broken, but this whole time we're starting to realize it, it was broken. And um, I think people are, tr are truly trying, people want the best, but um, we still have a long way to go. It's still real current for me. That's you absolutely do not take that home. They ask and you go, you don't want to know. I was working a lot of overtime last year and uh, I was trying to take care of myself and I didn't recognize the struggles that my, my wife was having. And I carry a lot of guilt with that because uh, I should have been there for her family first, you know? You know, I'm busy trying to deal with my demons and my stuff here at work and uh, I think our families get pushed to the wayside a lot of times and if we're really gonna go forward with this mental health push, we need to encompass every part of it. Not just us on the job, but our families and and, and people that are associated with us. You know, um, I think they often get left in the background. Yeah, there's usually a stigma attached to any kind of behavioral health issue in the fire service. I'm hoping to be a part of a committee that we just started at work that stops that stigma. Yeah, at first it's, you don't want to speak up. You don't want to say anything. You just want to pretend like you're the big bad firefighter. You know what you're doing. You've been around for a while. But what happens is you get back, especially when you're alone, you get back to the station. And if you're not processing that, you're not speaking to anybody. Eventually that's going to turn into some kind of negative behavior, whether it's happens at home whether it's drinking, whether it's alcohol, drugs, some kind of negative behavior is going to start if you don't have that outlet. I think there's the beginning of sufficient support in treating and maintaining behavioral health in firefighting. And one of the, the things that's difficult about approaching coworkers about mental health issues, and it's happened to myself. I had a day not that long ago where I called in sick and usually, Folks that know me at my work, if I call in sick, it's usually because I don't have a virus or something like that. It's something behavioral health related. I had an outpouring of support and people worried about me just because of that. And so you gotta be careful to walk that line. You don't wanna give too much and jump all over those people because then they're gonna just retreat further. Um, that's the fine line that's hard to balance. It's like, you wanna at least check on them but you don't want to over, be overbearing either. We're all doing the same job, just different title usually. I think the biggest thing to take away from it is even with all the mental health issues, we would all sign up to do it again. I will, I will bite that bullet because who else is gonna do it? I tend to have a little bit more empathy and compassion than some people, I'm not saying anything negative about anybody else, but if I know somebody's taking their last breath or, or I'm the only one around because family's not there, I'm gonna make sure that I can do everything to, to, to 
make sure their last moments are, are, are at least decent and not alone. Mental Health First Aid is a program that started in 2008 in the United States. It was actually uh, started originally in Australia in 2001. And the idea behind the program was to develop a program like CPR or First Aid, but for mental health. The people who started the program, uh, Tony Jorm and uh, Betty Kitchener, were walking their dog one day wondering why it was that nobody's ever done this. And when other countries learned about it, including the United States, uh, 26 other countries have uh, developed a mental health first aid program there, and ours started in the USA in 2008 with a partnership between the National Council for Mental Wellbeing and the State Departments of Mental Health for Maryland and Missouri. Essentially, the purpose of the mental health first aid program is to help people do a brief assessment, understand the risk that a person is under when they're experiencing mental health symptoms, look at, you know, are there specific risks, such as are they a danger to themselves, a danger to other people, are there areas of their life that might be at risk if the person doesn't get help, and then to provide a supportive listening environment where they're being heard and the person is feeling supported. Am I familiar with mental health first aid? I am so familiar with mental health first aid. I believe so deeply in mental health first aid. It is a course that folks can take to learn a little bit about how to support folks folks who might be experiencing some behavioral health crisis, or learn information about how to talk with others who might be experiencing a crisis. You know, I think sometimes we're worried. Are we gonna say the wrong things? Will we not connect? Mental Health First Aid has a structure that you can engage with to help you have conversations with other people. And it's not as scary as you think. And you don't have to be a licensed professional or a clinician to have this conversation. You can just be a person. And Mental Health First Aid helps you with that. I do believe that it does take a brave and courageous person to speak about historically marginalized situations such as mental illness to dismantle the stigmas that continue to remain around mental illness. Always listen to your gut. There is such stigma with mental health. It is it's pervasive. We would never ever think about treating somebody with diabetes or cancer or with a physical illness by locking them up. We treat people who have mental illness differently. We're scared of them. We're scared of folks who have mental illness. I present a lot in different places uh, about mental illness. And the one thing that I hear over and over and over again is that I don't know what to say. When I have somebody in front of me who is depressed or somebody who is suicidal, Susan, what do I say? What do I say? And often they say nothing. And then the result of that is the person who is in front of them feels dismissed. They feel, again, stigmatized. They, they feel as if they don't matter because we don't know what to say. We don't know how to extend our hearts to them, our feelings, and to wrap them instead of walk away. For mental health issues to not be stigmatized, 
people have to talk about them more. And folks need to know somebody or be able to willing to admit, you know, if they've gone through a time in their life where, let's say someone dealt with depression in their life and, um, and no, they're no longer dealing with that. It's good for them to share because it allows people to open up and share their story and understand that, you know, there's highs and lows in life. Uh, I think there's this, this expectation that in life that, you know, we're gonna start off and we're just gonna, things are just gonna get better and better and better as we go. But if you've been to any carnival and you know the most exciting ride is the roller coaster ride. Well, roller coasters have their ups and downs and so does life. And there's gonna be times where we struggle with mental issues and maybe it's something that's within us. Maybe it's something because of outside forces acting. Who knows the case may be, everybody's a little different. But I think that definitely if we keep promoting and talking about this and we understand that it's normal to have down days, it's normal to have down periods and seasons, it's it's normal for people to struggle with different things, but it's also normal to seek treatment and address those issues so that they can come out of that and not be stuck in that. I think the more we do that, the less stigmatized it'll be and the more that people will feel comfortable sharing. My sister was, um, she never admitted that she had a mental illness. Um, and so therefore she never received the help that she needed. And even though she was told, um, she neglected to seek help or even accept the fact that she had a mental illness. And very unfortunately, she passed away a few months ago um, because of the same, she suffered for, from um, depression and uh, she never accepted that fact. And so, yes, there, there affects, affects the family, especially when uh, family members are not willing to accept the help that they need. Even when you, on your own, but you by yourself, and no one accepts you, you can still move on. You can still live. There is still hope that someone, um, that you can do it, that you can, move on regardless. Be brave enough to start the conversation that matters. That's the kind of attitude you need to have with someone who is considering self-harm. And, and it is hard to start that conversation because of the stigma that many people associate with mental illness, that it's something that other people have or that it's, you know, it, that poor people have or that, you know, or that there's somehow a willful behavior. It's, it's very, it's the thought you need to have when you're wondering, gosh, my dad is, you know, saying he thinks about he'd be better off dead. And so you have to say, dad, we need to have a talk and get you some help. So in my own family, there's a history uh, of depression and a history of alcohol use disorder. It wasn't something that was really talked about as a family, you know, that these were issues, that they were family issues. And even as I became an adult and got into the mental health field, there wasn't a whole lot of discussion within the family about the, those conditions and how they had, had affected our family growing up. I remember uh, one of my family members telling a story about um, an issue where another family member who had an alcohol use problem was drinking and had, had um, gotten, things had gotten out of hand and there was violence in the house. And you know, by the time I had learned this, I was probably in my 20s, you know? And so finding out that these issues had impacted my family at a young age um, was, it was kind of a shock to me. People recover every day, all the time, from behavioral health issues. There is hope you will recover, even if you have a behavioral health issue that might occur over time. You know, that's like other health care issues. They might occur over time, and so we just want people to keep connected to the supports and the treatments and the systems that help them. Yes, there is hope for behavioral health. I just want to say that mental health first aid is for all the entire community on all, all walks of life, whether it's a faith-based group of people that are wanting to get involved with mental health first aid or if it's uh, military families or uh, that want to connect with mental health first aid and learn. I, I believe that mental health first aid is for the entire community. It's not for any particular group. It's for everyone, and it's just like taking CPR and first aid. 
It's an important aspect of learning how to intervene in a situation to where you can help somebody truly get help and support. Having a conversation about where those thoughts come from. Thoughts are derived from somewhere and being able to walk you through the process of how did you arrive at that thought and what have you done to try to change your mindset about it? Have you reached out? It could have been maybe you talked to someone and they didn't believe you or get you the help that you needed. I think it would be important to just kind of explore those thoughts to help you not to change your mind, but to have more of an understanding and an awareness so that you can educate yourself. What I like about the Mental Health First Aid program is it gives more of us information. It's a mental health literacy program in part, meaning it helps us to know more about mental health and the importance of mental health in our own and other people's lives. One of the pieces of evidence that came out of the program, which is an evidence-based program, was that people who take the course increase their own mental well-being. And it wasn't even an intention, but a, a nice consequence of people taking the course. But in terms of those who are interested in having a good mental health, health. It's a significant part of our lives. We know that our mental well-being impacts our physical well-being, and our physical well-being impacts our mental well-being. We are whole. We are whole people, and we have a whole system, including our mental health, that impacts how well we are. I mean, when we know that about ourselves and about the people we care uh, for and the people that we love, hopefully it implores us to help them out and support people where maybe before taking a class like mental health first aid, we wouldn't have considered doing that. The start of stigma is, uh, is the unknown of mental illness, right? We try to fill in the gaps, both as individuals. If I have a mental illness, uh, if I have depression or if I have anxiety, I don't know what is going on with me. If I have a pain in my knee or if I have a uh, heart condition, I'll go to a doctor, a doctor will do a, uh, a run a bunch of tests and I'll to a very close proximity know what is going on with me. With mental illness, uh, it's the starting point of that is very vague. I don't know when to approach a physician. I don't know when to go to a mental health provider. And from, from me starting to have or experiencing mental health symptoms to when I go seek services or I go seek a care, there is a very big lag because if I have pain, I'll know, okay, my pain is uh, such that I need to seek services. If I have sadness, I don't know when to seek services. And so there is a, there could be a very big time gap between me experiencing something and seeking services. And in that time gap, I am filling in thoughts about, okay, maybe I did something wrong. That's why I'm having these symptoms. Maybe my family didn't take care of me. That's why I'm having these symptoms. Maybe I didn't get along with my friend or my girlfriend or my boyfriend. That's why I'm having these symptoms. Maybe I was born wrong or something. Maybe it is God. People from whichever background they're coming from, they fill in those gaps, unknowns with their own thoughts. And that's where kind of the stigma in their own mind starts. I think we need to bring in mental health care more proximate to where the patients are so that they can seek services faster. And that time gap between person experiencing symptoms and seeking services decreases. And as the time gap decreases, the, the void that is being filled in with superfluous stuff gets filled in with accurate information. And as that uh, time gap is filled with accurate information, more proximate to what the disease is, the stigma kind of decreases. How bad did it get? It got as about as bad as it gets till you can't get out. It was starting with the the painkillers from my my accidents racing motorcycles. 
I got on the medication, but then for work, the wear and tear, it started out gradually. With the dependency on that, my tolerance got so high that I would need more medication. And then it got so severe that I'd be working out of town. And if I couldn't afford the painkillers to then get me through the work week, withdrawal would kick in during the work week. And then therefore I couldn't do the work. And so I'd call in sick and you know I, I wouldn't be able to make it, but eventually they had to find somebody else which is understandable that uh, it, it had that much of a stronghold. Then it was continued into also amphetamines, which then I, I didn't have the mental state or the capacity or the ability to maintain a job because uh, it was just the fluctuation of all the different mental health, whether it be depression, not being able to even communicate. And so I, I lost that and uh, became stubborn and angry and eventually ended up homeless. A lot of what we see when we work with adults in behavioral health is that there's an interplay between substance use and trauma issues. And this is one of the most common things that we see in the adult outpatient treatment settings that we work in. And that is that when a person experiences trauma in their life, it creates disruption within the nervous system, within the mind, within the brain. And that tends to reverberate in their lives in different ways. For some people, it looks like post-traumatic stress disorder. For other people, it looks like just more of a chronic anxiety. That disruption or that overactivity in the, in the nervous system and, the, and in the mind um, is very painful for that person. Oftentimes, people discover in their lives that using drugs or alcohol will uh, change that activity, nervous system activity enough to bring comfort, to bring a little bit of peace. As they become more accustomed to using substances over time, that's when uh, substance use disorders develop. And you see that there's an interplay between trauma and substance use where um, the substance itself creates a feeling of uh, relief or a feeling of comfort, and, um, but also at the same time causes other disruptions in the person's life so much so often that they wind up experiencing more trauma. So a person who's in a cycle of using substances may be in positions of being vulnerable once again or being around people that are likely to cause um, further traumas in their lives. And so they wind up being re-traumatized and then using substances to medicate the effects of those trauma, which creates then a cycle. It's a cycle where substance use creates a feeling of comfort but also creates more risk and more um, chaos in the person's life, which then leads to more trauma, which then leads to more substance use. And those two things play, play off of each other back and forth over time. In addition to their traumas that they're experiencing as adults, they've also got childhood experiences that kind of set the stage for trauma, overactivation of the nervous system, and that need to kind of figure out, find ways in their lives to deactivate the nervous system, to bring it down from a high level of arousal down to a lower level. And that's really where substance and addiction issues come in for many, many folks. There, was there shame and embarrassment? Yes, absolutely, the entire time. Um, because I didn't want to, you know, but the pains and the mental health, either physically or mentally, uh, it starts out thinking that I will get control of that. But then knowing deep down, you know, it's. I, I think therapy or just speaking on someone, the shame and the embarrassment and the guilt add up to where it could become a very severe mental uh, aspect. I was so severe and so independent and scared of love that I, I, I wasn't in a relationship. I was trying to, I was already hurt so much mentally that it looked, I wasn't prepared for, you know, so I, I isolated and just did a lot of substances, but I was unaware of how hurtful that is to your family. Um, I'm having a child at the end of the year and I'm engaged now, so I'm starting to feel those emotions, but um, it's very difficult to deal with uh, knowing that so many people put so much time and so much of their hurt in the back to provide a good life for me and my brother. I did my part on the separation from my family because my parents always cared and then some people think tough love and you know all that uh it just people it brings different opinions and views on how it should be dealt with and um it caused a lot of trouble um and separation my one chunk of advice that i give anybody and everybody is don't give up never give up 
when you're believing you can, that's the first step. And when you believe you can take that step or you can believe you can make that number, that dial, or you believe you can just be honest and open and you're just sick and tired of being sick and tired like I was, that is the advice to just keep pushing, keep moving, keep going until you can't because the human body can go far beyond physically and mentally than what most people think. But as long as you don't give up and you keep positive and you keep maintaining that, there's no telling. All, all, who knows? Only God knows. There is hope. As, as I said before, treatment works. I think when you hear comments like, oh, homeless people just want to be homeless. So are you joking? Seriously, have you really thought that through? When people are put up uh, into conditions of dramatic displacement, you're beat down. You're beat down from all directions. Society is very judgmental. Stigma is very, very clear and present. The community around you is not tolerant. And so you're left with a majorly compromised life and you cannot start on bettering yourself until you can get to a better place than that. I believe it's possible that stigma can be significantly decreased. Stigma is reason number one, two, or three in every national study on why people don't seek treatment. But I think of how we used to talk about physical disabilities. And I remember when it was socially acceptable to call somebody in a wheelchair a cripple or a handicap. And that today people would never think about doing that. Or if somebody did say that, people would have uh, really poor reactions. It wouldn't be a good experience for folks. And that was in, in my childhood. So within the last 40 years, there's been a shift. I believe the same kind of thing can happen. The more of us who know more about mental health issues puts us in a better place to be supportive to those who experience them. We will bust the stigma. We're talking about it. We think it's important. We're connecting about it today. We're working together in our community. We care about each other. And I think that that means everything. And so will the stigma around behavioral health conditions go away? We will make it so. Within society, people historically who have experienced mental health conditions become marginalized by the people that they live with or the people that live in their communities. Many societies have, and subsets of the culture have not learned how to deal with mental health conditions. They don't have you know, systems for, of support for people who are experiencing mental health conditions. Now, um, we see that there's a lot more acceptance and a lot more openness to um, people getting treatment for mental health conditions, but there's still a lot of, I think, negative stigma or shame that's um, built around people's experience of mental illness. And so when somebody's starting to have mental health symptoms, they may not know where to go to get help. Even if they know where to go to get help, they may be uh, hesitant to seek out that help because of that shame that still kind of persists in society. I think we need to be talking about it. I think we need to be sharing our personal experiences so people don't feel alone and isolated and like they're the only one that has this challenge or maybe feels this way. At least in my profession, the stigma is starting to disappear as we realize that substance use and self-medicating go hand in hand with untreated mental health issues. I feel that that is part of our stewardship as human beings to each other, to be a support. You never know if you're the one that's going to be the one receiving the support or giving the support. One of the things that I don't ever really talk about, there was a point in my life, the reason why I am in this field, is that I had a point in my life where I had tremendous loss that I did not think I would recover from. The response from the behavioral health field was not only stigmatizing, but it was hurtful. I did not think I would heal from the response from the mental health field. My response to that was, if I do anything in my lifetime, I will do everything in my power to change that. And it is why I'm a therapist today. Anybody can be affected by it. From the people who really seem to have it together to people who 
are homeless. Each person is going to deal with their own mental illness in their own certain way. Some may be more resilient than others to be able to bounce back and be able to realize that they maybe need a little bit more help than what they're getting. And if they're able to speak up and, and say that they need some help, definitely I think that that's possible. Another thing that I do is I run men's support groups in Spanish and English. When the dynamic changes in the group is when a person really shares something intimate and personal. When they say, I am living with depression, I am living with alcoholism, I am working on this. And all of a sudden, all the other guys feel free to talk. They start sharing their deepest things because, because somebody brought it up. To be able to talk about mental health disorders, especially if we're living with that, takes vulnerability. To be the one that starts the conversation that says, you know what, I'm, I'm feeling suicidal, I'm feeling depressed. And to be the one that does not perpetuate that stigma, that does not put up with somebody saying, you know, horrible words about people that live with mental health uh, conditions. You can be the difference by doing that. I just have the picture in my head of, <laughs> the little kid with the plastic helmet that wants to be a fireman. That was me. And at one point in my career, I didn't know if I would make it to where we are today. And it was because I had to get rid of that stigma. Be brave enough to start a conversation that matters. It takes bravery. It takes a lot to talk to somebody. A lot of times it's intimidating. Not only are you asking them to put themselves out there, but you're putting yourself out there. Sometimes physically, but sometimes just open. And sometimes that starting the conversation is just explaining to them or, or being a little vulnerable about something you've dealt with in the past before. But I like that. Be brave enough to start the conversation. That's a good quote. <laughs> That's really the central focus with Mental Health First Aid. Mental Health First Aid is a program that everybody needs to have. I've had so many people go through the class and say, I wish I would have known this years ago. I wish I could have had uh, this knowledge that I could have helped a family member or others. And in some instances, save lives like CPR or Mental Health First Aid is a program intended to have us help people save lives. Tell your neighbors, tell your friends, take a course, go with them. Um, show people that we care for people who experience mental health and substance use challenges. We can reduce the stigma about mental health and mental illnesses in our communities and that we can all be the difference. My grandmother was admitted to what was called Kansas City State Lunatic Asylum Number 2, and she was admitted there in 1941, and she stayed there for 35 years of her life. This was not something that we talked about in my family at all. So what I have is my, my grandmother's chart here. I was able to travel back to Missouri. They've turned the institution into a museum, and there was an old medical record store there when I went with my dad and my uncle, we went back to the site of where they had last seen their mom admitted there at that hospital. And I thought, could, could I get in there and get her medical record here in 2013? And, and yes, I actually got a form and a judge released her chart to us. She has since uh, passed away. But uh, Aura Grace Eberhardt, my grandmother, uh, was admitted for over 35 years of her life in an inpatient psychiatric institution. And what I can tell you in reading this chart is that it was is so impactful to read about her experience, but also the staff who really tried to care for her. You know, in the, in the year she was admitted, 1941 through 1975-ish, there was a lot going on in behavioral health policy to include what we know to be the deinstitutionalization of behavioral health, folks getting discharged in the 60s out of inpatient settings. And she was discharged back to our family, but you know, we weren't able and ready to support her. And so I think family members knowing more, talking more about what maybe she would have needed would have helped us a little bit. She did go back into an institution and live the remainder of her life there. I bring her chart because I want to share her story and the fact that we can talk about these things. We can talk about how it impacts us and our family. We can look at how we offer services and we can learn. And we can appreciate people who provide behavioral health services and who are there with our loved ones. And we can 
step into those roles ourselves and we can claim a bit of our family back and we can help ourselves heal as we talk about what we have been through together. We have a very unique community here. In my whole career, I have not seen people come together taking mental health first aid, being interested in helping the way this community is interested in helping others. We have people who are coming into the field because it's their heart. When we interview them, we know that their heart is with the people who are suffering and they're making a difference. I get to work with a team of people that are just phenomenal in listening, in engaging, and encouraging people to be their whole self. So I, I feel very excited about that. I see so much hope for mental health and behavioral health and the disease of addiction and folks recovering and living happy and satisfying lives. People recover every day, all the time, from behavioral health issues. There is hope you will recover, even if you have a behavioral health issue that might occur over time. You know, that's like other healthcare issues. They might occur over time, and so we just want people to keep connected to the supports and the treatments and the systems that help them. Yes, there is hope for behavioral health. Let's see. I think I said all the things. I'm passionate about it. I hope it comes through. Thank you.